um, there has been a lot of discussion about privacy, both GDPR, but also other things that are related to privacy on social media. What is happening now? You talked about privacy two years ago. What has changed? So, I, I think we have seen uh, two or three very interesting things about privacy. So, of course, GDPR has been updated. We all know that. But some other things that have been happening. So, we had North Korea attacked uh, Sony movies and leaked uh, lots of data from, from them in order to retaliate uh, for a movie they made as you might recall. Revenge is a classic motivation. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and these... Um, um, so, so that shows that there are even state actors who will use uh, a lack of privacy protection uh, as political leverage. Another thing that happened is that there has been a number of significant large data breaches. We had... Um, for instance, a uh, credit uh, rating, a credit scoring company in the US. Equifax. Who managed to leak a lot of, uh, of data by mistake. There was, I saw in the newspaper today, a leak from an airline company. So there has been leaks that have not been the result of, of um, attacks, but of clumsiness. Yeah, so it's not state-sponsored attacks, but just ordinary criminals. No, it's not criminals. It, it's just... Uh, uh, a lack of privacy protection in in their uh, environment uh, that has led to mistakes. So if I if, if I'm not mistaken, in the case of Equifax, they uploaded a file to a file sharing uh, facility where it wasn't protected. I so it, so it wasn't intentional. Uh, it was just a huge mistake. So it's sloppiness more or less. I wouldn't call it sloppiness. I think that um, it wasn't like they knew what to do and then they, then they did something else. I think that they really didn't know what to do and there weren't protections in place to prevent mm. them from doing the wrong thing. But, you know, I'm, I'm not fully read up on it. But, but I think it's a, it's a lack of protection, not sloppiness. And the third thing, of course, is... Uh, things like Cambridge Analytica uh, with Facebook, where uh, it's not stolen, it's not leaked by mistake, but it's actually sold. Your information is sold, and then it's repurposed and reused in a way that you could never have imagined uh, previously. Yeah. So it's like you're selling a product for a certain purpose, and then the user use it for uh, a legal ways. Yes, yes. And, th and that is the problem, that one state that has left your control, whether you're the uh, individual or, or Facebook or, or whoever, once it's in the hands of someone else, how will you prevent them from doing what they want to do with the data? Of course, uh, in the case of Facebook, they, there were contracts that said you can't do this, but th then it happened anyway. So, um, well, Cambridge Analytica has been... Uh, dismantled as a company, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. But it, it, it really, really shows um, that you need to have, as GDPR puts it, privacy by design and not privacy as an afterthought. And uh, GDPR, what's happening there? There was uh, some news from the Swedish authorities lately. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to. It was an article that they have uh, made uh, an audit and found that a number of companies with huge number of users, financial companies, insurance companies and telcos didn't have DPOs and uh, some of them didn't get those DPOs in place even after the authorities told them. No oh, I, I totally missed that. Okay, that, yeah. that is a very very easy mistake to avoid. That's just a question of getting a data protection officer in place. Yeah. Register a name, more or less. <laughs> yes, of course, with the huge responsibility that comes with the job, 
I can understand that uh, people are a bit reluctant to take on the responsibility. Mm. That, uh, but, but we see that only, according to a survey, uh, about 20% of companies say they're fully done with GDPR implementation. A lot of companies say we've done the necessary, but now we need to do more. And I think uh, there are areas where many companies need to improve. So we have, uh, in terms of master data management, knowing where the data is, and not just the GDPR data, but all your data. Now, where, how many places are the, is there data about your customers? In which systems do you have that data? Yeah, a lot of them in large companies. That's well, my uh, experience. Exactly. And often it will be uh, contradictory. So one system will say this, and another system will say that, and so on. So, so it's uh, also a source for mistakes. But, but you need to have this under control, according to GDPR. Uh, and also the quality of data is lacking, and that is also exactly. relevant. Yes, I mean you need to have correct data, and if it's not correct, you can be forced to, to fix it. But, but when, you, when you have the correct data and you know where it is, there is also the question of identity and access management, because according to GDPR you need to know who has access, what they do with the data, and uh, if access has been revoked. So you need to have that in a really good manner, and, and uh, it's not often done the correct way. And of course, you, you couple with that, you need strong authentication. Another thing that you need is um, system protections of various sorts, especially uh, so, so if you have a network or if you have storage, uh, so that there is encryption, uh, there are tools that will help you to retrofit encryption where, where if it wasn't there in the first place because everyone has some legacy systems that are maybe not up to standard. Uh, so that needs to be taken care of. And then, and then the last thing that I haven't seen a lot of is data exfiltration prevention. So data exfiltration prevention is exactly what would have helped uh, Equifax uh, to avoid the mistake yeah. they made. Yeah, so it's more or less... Um email filter, for example, that you can't send away confidential information. So, so data exploitation prevention, uh, the advanced ones, um, monitor all the endpoints, it uses artificial intelligence, and it, it will raise an alert. Let's say, let's say you, you start putting a lot of, of personal data in an Excel file. It will say, there is a lot of personal da data in this Excel file. Why? And then you give a little reason, a business reason, but then you try to upload it to an online sharing service and it would say, no. Uh, You're not allowed. That, that is not even allowed, even if you give an explanation. Mm. So, so these four things, um, uh, master data management, integrity, identity and access management, um, system protections and data exfiltration, exfiltration prevention, are not fully implemented in most companies, and that needs to happen in order mm -hmm. to be GDPR compliant. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, having a, a data protection officer. Yeah. So it's a lot of thing to do. But you talked about AI. If we go to LinkedIn, we can see a lot of buzzwords there. New newspaper in the IT sector, also a lot of discussion about AI. What's happening now? Is it artificial intelligence or just lack of intelligence? There are, uh, there are a lot of things that can be done uh, with AI, of course. And I think that, that we've finally reached a technology threshold in terms of algorithms, but also in computing power, where it's now possible to, to do things with AI. Uh, I think what we're seeing now is an explosion of uh, picking uh, low-hanging fruit. And that's why it seems like there is a lot of progress. I think that the low-hanging fruit will be picked and then it will be much harder to really, really make a difference with AI. Mm. Uh, I heard an example with the new Pixel phone from Google that it will uh, record some extra shots when you're taking a photo and if the photo you take is not good enough, then it will suggest that Yes, I took some extra photos, but if your photo is good, then they scrap those photos. Is so, so I took a few photos with my camera the other day, with my phone, and um, 
I'll show you. Then it says actually in Google, Google Photos um, that um, this is the best shot. Yeah. So it already, it's already doing this. Yeah. Even if you don't have a special hardware feature for it. Yeah, so it's in the cloud. It's in the cloud. Yeah. So if you take three or four photos, it will automatically be rated for the best right. shot. Is uh, AI and cloud very much tied together so that the cloud is a prerequisite for AI or can it be handled without the cloud? Because then we have the security implications. So in AI, you have the kind of decision rules or neural networks or whatever, and then you have the actual data. And developing the rules... Uh, or you need data. You need a lot of data and a lot of processing power. So, so there are some offerings, like IBM has a special uh, GPU hardware uh, offering where, where they say what you used to say takes seven days to run, it now takes seven minutes or whatever. Uh, so, so, but that kind of service is available in the cloud. So instead of having your own huge server farm, you can farm it out to a cloud. So that's, that's one way. Another way is that a lot of AI algorithms have been implemented as cloud services. Uh, and the third thing is um, uh, the ability to execute and of course also to develop because when you're doing AI, it's going to be a lot of experimenting, like what is good, is this good, is that good? Does it catch up? Uh, okay, so it's AI, but is it a big enough of an improvement? Uh, so that allows you to turn things on and turn things off and so on. So, and then you ask, um, um, does it have, uh, affect privacy? Well, unless you have uh, no internet connection, at all. Uh, there is no more privacy in one computer than another computer. And even if you have no internet connection, you'll still need a USB port for maintenance and so on, and then you're still, you're still vulnerable. So mm. The level of privacy is, you can't have 100%, but you can have zero. You, the kind of protections that you need to be in the cloud are the same kind of protections that you should do for your on-premise computers. Mm. So it's not more secure because it's in on-premise, unless it's, there is no internet connection at all. So uh, what about cloud computing when it's not talking about AI? What's happening uh, with the companies? Because now we talked about cloud computing from a consumer perspective. The consumers are embracing the cloud, but how are the companies? Are they doing that? Well, if you look at analyst reports, um, you, there is a heavy growth in cloud computing, uh, mostly in uh, software as a service, platform as a service, uh, software as a service, of course, things like like uh, uh, Salesforce and so on, that, that is uh, really picking up. Um, Office uh, um, from Microsoft, of course, uh, as a cloud service. Mm, Share, SharePoint and other sites. So SharePoint Online and so on. So there, there is a lot of traction from companies to use, uh, the, using and moving to the cloud. Uh, so it's those more infrastructural applications. Mm, if you count, uh, if you count that, but there is also like online e-commerce and so on. I, we, we've talked, we talked about before how easy it is to set up uh, your own online company nowadays because everything is available. Um, like website as a service, e-commerce as a service, manufacturing as a service, mm. logistics as a service. Mm. Um, you can, you can uh, from idea to, to selling your first product, it can take less than eight hours. Mm. It's very easy to stop. But how is it with the legacy then? Yeah. So people, so okay. So the, the, the uh, people are moving to the cloud and, and uh, moving to the cloud you need uh, some form of cloud operations uh, and, and uh, advisory. So there, there is um, increased interest in that from, uh, from customers. Security operations, of course, um, data encryption, uh, all of that needs to be in place. So uh, can you move legacy to the cloud? So some legacy applications are not 
in a, from a security manner, not cloud friendly. A cloud friendly application should have encryption everywhere and so on. It should have a, um, it should be designed with what I call zero trust architecture. That is the realization that being hacked is not a theory; it's a fact. At some point, one or all of your components will be hacked. So it's about minimizing the impact when that happens. So all, all of that is not, maybe not available in a, in, in a legacy application. So it not, need to be refactored. But there are also tools that can add a kind of layer of protection around your application and around the communications. So, so there are ways around that. And then you wonder, well, what can I run? I'm, I have mainframe computer or, or and so on. Can I run that in the cloud? And yes, you can. Uh, the mainframe was the cloud computer when I started working. Mm. But there, there are mainframe computers available in one form or another yeah. as cloud computers. So it's not all about uh, um, uh, Linux and, and Windows. There oh. are many more things in the cloud. We, we, we shouldn't just look at the top one or two or three providers. If you look at, at the entire landscape of, of public cloud, hybrid cloud, private cloud, uh, and so on, and there is a lot more. Than, than what you see on the first page of the, of the business papers. Yeah. But will you have any business benefits of uh, moving to the cloud with legacy applications? Is it more hassle than uh, doing it? Is it worth it? Okay, so it's worth it because it forces you to reconsider your legacy applications and, and their security and their functionality and so on. It is worth it if, you, for instance, let's say you had a, a mainframe that was running hundreds of applications. Now there's only one left on it. Well, then it's much better to use someone else's mainframe to, to do time sharing. So cutting, cutting cost, uh, decreasing your investment, uh, because like if you have your own data center, you buy the things in, in the cloud. You can rent them, but you can also, of course, rent your own data center. But. Uh, there, there's no uh, there's no given answer you have to do a business case <laughs>